The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Last weekend, judging by social media, our province was furious from stem to stern. Amidst record COVID-19 case counts in the depths of a third wave, the Ontario government's moves didn't add up to citizens of all political stripes. And it's been on its heels ever since. Tonight, we'll check in with members of the Queen's Park Press Gallery on what was perhaps an unprecedented last few days. Then, long-suffering Toronto Maple Leaf fans may know the significance of today's date, as will fans of the Tragically Hip. We'll hear why a goal scored seven decades ago tonight still stands as the franchise's most iconic. It's Wednesday, April 21st, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. Well, this has been, I think, an unprecedented last few days in the province of Ontario. Last Friday, Premier Doug Ford's late afternoon press conference, a firestorm of negative reaction over the weekend, and a bit of a volt fuss after that. Even the police told the Premier, no, we're not going to do that. Let's bring in two veterans of the Provincial Press Corps to help figure it all out. There's Robert Benzie, Queen's Park Bureau Chief of the Toronto Star, joining us from the downtown core of the provincial capital. And in the Riverdale area of the city, Jessica Smith-Cross, Editor-in-Chief for the Provincial Affairs website, QP, QP Briefing, excuse me. And uh, welcome you two. Rob, I'm going to start off with a bit of a weird question. How long have you been covering Queen's Park? Uh, 20 years, more than 20 years, more than 20 years. You ever seen a I weekend know, like we just had? I'm so young. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're young and gorgeous, but have you ever seen a weekend like the one we just had? I, I was speaking to a senior conservative official on the weekend, Steve, who said that they had never seen such a negative reaction to, um, the, to a government announcement as they saw on Saturday, Friday afternoon, Saturday after premier Ford announced the closure of playgrounds and golf courses and tennis courts and enhanced police powers, uh, so that the police could stop and uh, ask people where they were going and give them a $750 ticket if they refused to say uh, where they were going. So it was it was a uh, a cluster mess, we'll say. And uh, they uh, they re they retrenched a little bit on Saturday, uh, you know, opening playgrounds again. And 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 after 30 police forces in Ontario said that they weren't going to enforce the law, uh, they had to back down on that. I mean, you had the situation uh, later on in the week with. Um, uh, Mayor Jim Watson in Ottawa and the Ottawa police not uh, going to be doing 24 hour uh, border checks between Quebec and Ontario because of the cost of, of, of policing there. Um, and that was another one of the controversial measures outlined by Premier Ford and Sylvia Jones, the still Solicitor General for now. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a messy situation and it's compounded, of course, by the fact that the Premier is now in quarantine and isolation for the next 14 days because one of his uh, close aides uh, tested positive for COVID-19 last night. Mr. Ford had a test. He does not have COVID-19. He did get his injection uh, Astra of AstraZeneca uh, about almost two weeks ago, but he has to isolate and that's what he's doing. Jessica, maybe you've got to help us figure this out. And this is not at all a smart aleck question, but the, the members of the Ontario cabinet have had several marathon meetings they're reasonably intelligent people. They hear advice. They come to a decision. How did they get it so apparently off base compared to what the population was expecting? Well, I can't read their minds, but I have tried to imagine what those meetings are like. And I, I can't imagine that it's any fun at all. Everybody has a different way of thinking about the pandemic, thinking about what needs to be done. These people come from different parts of the province where the pandemic is playing out differently. They're also politicians with strong views and to have them all in a room together, trying to come to a consensus, trying to come together. I'm not entirely surprised that it's taken quite as long as it has. Yeah. Let me follow up with you on this, Jessica, because, of course, governments can only govern with the consent of the governed, right? They need the authority of the people in order to make their decisions. One of the biggest criticisms we saw over the past weekend, and Rob has laid it out well, is that they seem to have got it if I can use the colloquial expression, kind of ask backwards on so many things. <laughs> Closing down play playgrounds that ought to be open, giving police powers that the police don't even want. 
And now we have the specter of Toronto and Peel closing down businesses, using that Section 22 of the Health Act to close down businesses where COVID is a particular problem. Do you see any indication yet of concern from the Premier's office that they are losing the authority they need to govern this province appropriately? Yes, and that's why you are seeing the climb downs, why he was very quick to go on Twitter and say, actually, no, we were wrong on playgrounds. We're going to open them up again. That decision impacted so many people's lives. I'm the mother of the toddler. I can tell you it resonated with me. Uh, he does know that he's losing the public, and the polls are telling them that as well, and they're going to respond to that. Hmm. Um, Rob mentioned Sylvia Jones, the Solicitor General, just a moment ago, and it was her comments at the news conference last Friday that really got the wheels in motion. Let's take a look at that, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. After consulting with public health experts, we have made the deliberate decision to temporarily enhance police officers' authority for the duration of the stay-at-home order. Moving forward, police will have the authority to require any individual who is not in a place of residence to first provide their purpose for not being at home and provide their home address. Police will also have the authority to stop a vehicle to inquire about an individual's reason for leaving their residence. Now, Robert, in fairness, the one thing we don't know from that announcement is whether she wanted to make it, whether she was forced to make it. Um, you know, these are decisions that the cabinet takes in solidarity, but you never really know what they're thinking deep in their hearts. Do you have any insight onto how a decision which was widely mocked ended up being made in the first place? Yeah, you know what the problem is, Steve? They got told by the doctors that they need to limit mobility. And the best way to limit mobility is to get, get people not to go to work, so to close more workplaces. But they didn't want to do that. So they thought, well, if there's another way to limit mobility, it's maybe having police, you know, harassing people uh, when they're driving around and try to keep people off the roads. The problem with that, and I think John Horgan in British Columbia is going to find that it's a problem, is that it, it's infringing people's civil liberties, because in D.C. They're, they're proposing even more draconian measures on that front. And I think they... they they, they looked at a, a problem that they had and used a sledgehammer to try and fix it, and then it ended up smashing what they were trying to fix. I mean, at the end of the day, the doctors and scientists say limit mobility. The doctors and scientists didn't say have the police uh, be uh, hounding everyone and their uncle while they're driving around in Ontario. That is just not a good look. And yes, Sylvia Jones delivered the message, but I'm told that no one at Cabinet said this is a bad idea. So, uh, you know, they, they, they are all wearing it. And the premier then had to, you know, walk it back the next day, which is a stunning U-turn. Well, it's a stunning U-turn, Jessica, because I'm not sure we've had a premier who was a better friend of the police services across this province than this current premier. He has been loyal to them. They have been loyal to him. And yet, within a very short period of time after this announcement, service after service after service, first just a few, and then an onslaught came out and said, we're not going to do this. Uh, what does that tell you about the state of the relationship between the cops and the premier right now? Obviously that the premier and, and the government didn't consult with the police services, perhaps beyond the OPP, which is something they needed to do before implementing a change like that. But they're on the ropes. Everything's happening at once. It seems like that decision was made within the two-day cabinet meeting. If they had planned ahead, checked out if that would have flown with the police before implementing it, it would have been a different scenario. Hmm. Yeah. Robert, what are you hearing about morale on the PC backbenches right now? Uh, in the, on the back benches, well, on the back benches is not great. I don't think it's so great in the front benches either. Cabinet is ornery. They're they're right now scrambling to put together a provincial paid sick leave program because they've been getting pasted on that. They have a little bit of political cover because they were saying though, well, maybe if Christia Freeland enriches the program in the federal budget on Monday, we can we we won't have to do anything. She didn't because there already is the uh, the Canada Emergency Sick Pay Benefit, um, uh, and it wasn't enhanced. So now it's up to Labor Minister Monty McNaughton and Premier Doug Ford to come up with a solution, which they will do. I don't know if it'll be this week. It may be next week. But they've been getting hounded on that front. So that should help morale a little bit. But you talked to backbenchers. You had Christina Midas from Scarborough writing a letter to her colleagues that was leaked to the media on the weekend saying this is ridiculous that we're closing playgrounds. She's a, a mother of young children like Jess is and, uh, you know, and everyone with kids. I was at walking around playgrounds on, at, on Saturday just because I was curious, Steve, to see what the scene was like in downtown Toronto. And 
parents were with their kids on, on the playgrounds. And that's because at a certain point, if you, uh, I mean, play, parents realize they need to keep their kids active, <laughs> occupied and active, or they're going to be driven, driven uh, crazy themselves. And I think that that was one of these situations where, as you said, they have, you have to have the consent of the governed. And when people are taking the law into their own hand, really, and, or ignoring the law, that's a big problem. So there is a very big danger that Premier Ford has lost the room uh, and that, you know, he needs to really work at, at, at getting the room back. Sheldon, I'm just going to ask our director for a second. I'm pulling an audible here. We're going to go to uh, roll in two right now because Rob just mentioned sick days and I was going to bring this up later, but let's do it now. Uh, the Minister of Labor, the Minister of Health, uh, as you indicated, Rob, have been resisting bringing in a paid sick days plan, but they hinted yesterday that maybe something's coming down the pike. Uh, let's roll this clip and then we'll come back and chat. This was a federal program that was to supply the, the sick benefits. It uh, didn't seem necessary for us to institute another program if there already was a federal program that could have been improved. However, it was clear yesterday with the budget that it was not going to be improved by the federal government. And so we are considering our, our alternatives now to deal with those gaps. Clearly, uh, there's gaps uh, in the system. Uh, I can assure workers out there that uh, I'm going to have their backs to ensure that uh, they're protected uh, during COVID-19 and beyond. I'm going to have their back. So said Monty McNaughton, the Labour Minister, Christine Elliott, the Health Minister before that. Jessica, here's the question. That announcement yesterday, the climb down over the weekend, how much has that simmered things down in your judgment? I don't know how much it helps with the anger because everybody who sees what decisions were made initially is still upset by them. I'm not sure it helps with the anger for people who don't want to see measures like that, because now they're going to happen. That's the problem with constantly making a decision and then reversing yourself. I mean, in the past two weeks, we saw the government not implement a stay-at-home order and then implement one. Not do testing to people below 50 in hot spots and then lower it to 18 the next day. And, and everything else that we see, playgrounds, police, and now sick days. That's why governing consistently tends to be better for public relations. Hmm. Rob, though, they have, they have said for months and months and months, the sick days paid program is a hill we're prepared to die on. They have insisted it wasn't needed. Then came yesterday's announcement. What's changed? I think p p political reality is setting in, Steve. And Jess is right. Like, I mean, it's it's tricky. It's tricky to govern in a pandemic. The situation is fluid. I think that there there's some context is needed. Ontario is not a burning dumpster fire, as some claim, uh, compared to other jurisdictions. Arguably, well, it's not arguable. The, the statistics show that per capita, our performance has been uh, comparable or better than New York, Michigan, Quebec or uh, or uh, Manitoba. In fact, Quebec, with three-fifths of our population, has had 40% more COVID deaths. But for whatever reason, the, in the last six to eight weeks, the Tories here at Queen's Park have just been stumbling and flailing. And I think, as Jess was mentioning, there is a lot of pressure on Ford from his caucus, from his cabinet, from the business community to open things, more, uh, open things up. And at the same time, the scientists and doctors were saying, you know what? Don't open things up. These new variants are much more contagious. This third wave is hitting us a lot harder than we than we feared. So we have to be super careful and super vigilant just for a little while longer until more people are vaccinated. But, you know, the, the premier, I guess, took a took a look at it and gambled and and lost. And that's why they're having to scramble and do what they're doing now and paid sick days. That's not going to be a panacea, Steve. It's really not. But it at least shows the public that they're taking seriously what, uh, some of their uh, missteps from before and they're making uh, trying to make amends. Jessica, I wonder whether this issue is more problematic for the progressive conservative party as government than it would be for either a new democratic or liberal party uh, if they were in government right now. I mean, it, it seems to me that those other two parties now in opposition would clearly be listening to the scientists and worry much less about what business was saying and therefore, and, and certainly the Liberals and New Democrats don't have a kind of a libertarian wing of their parties, which the PC party do have. How does that complicate matters for the PCs at the moment? 
It doesn't make it easy. And I think it's easy to say that you would side with the experts and take nothing, no political realities into account when you're in opposition rather than in government. So I'm not entirely convinced we would have had a perfect adherence to science should either of other, the other parties been in government. But to have them standing there saying that they would have done things perfectly certainly doesn't help the government right now. Right. Yeah. Uh, Robert, um, it, it is always a danger to say on April 21st, 2021, what you think is going to happen in June of 2022 when there's the next Ontario election. We are a long way away from that. Now, admittedly, before all this happened, the last, I think, few polls in a row had the progressive conservatives in a pretty decent first place position. Uh, a new insight uh, innovation research group poll came out now, and they're not in first place anymore. Uh, how terrified are the Tories about the, the fall they're apparently taking at the moment? Well, they're obviously skittish. I mean, I was pouring over Greg Lyle's poll last night, and there are some interesting findings in there that if I were a conservative strategist or a conservative MPP or a conservative cabinet minister, I would be concerned about. And I think that's why you're seeing things like the paid sick leave uh, U-turn and, and other flip-flops. I mean, I mean, the, the idea that these guys are particularly ideological, it's not. I mean, Steve, you and I have covered some ideological governments. The, the, these are the Ford and, and company are not necessarily they're not fiscal conservatives. They're certainly not neoconservatives uh, like the early Mike Harris government was. These guys are Ford himself is a populist and is spending more money than any government in Ontario has ever spent. Twenty percent more this year than uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne's liberals did in their last year in 2018. So it's not about fiscal conservatism or any ideological uh, concern. I think, though, that they are vulnerable in the sense that Ford had, a, relatively speaking, Ford did, did relatively well during the pandemic, during most of the pandemic, other than the long-term care uh, situation where, you know, 60% of our deaths have been in long-term care homes. And now everyone there has been vaccinated and, and, and there haven't been the same deaths in long-term care homes from COVID-19. Other than that, uh, the, the, until this last third wave, the government had not been doing so poorly, and we saw that in the polls. However, the slippage is incredible, and people who were giving Ford the benefit of the doubt before are not going to give him the benefit of the doubt now. And remember, we in the summer of 2019, when Doug Ford was booed at the Raptors' victory parade while Justin Trudeau and Mayor John Tory of Toronto were cheered in Nathan Phillips Square, mm -hmm. Doug Ford was in very big political trouble then. The pandemic... Early, the early part of the pandemic probably helped his political fortunes, but he's in danger of slipping back to where he was two years ago. Yeah, Jessica, I don't know if you can even answer this, but but because uh, <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get how how what's happened in the province of Quebec has not seemed to dent the popularity yeah. of the premier of Quebec one iota. He may have dropped a couple of points, but that's about it. Doug Ford, conversely, whose record on deaths in this province per capita is not as bad as the record in Quebec, he is taking a pasting. Can anybody explain that to me? What I can say is that I think I understood the bump he got at the beginning. When people were so uncertain about everything and, and so scared, he would show up and he would speak in this authoritative sort of fatherly tone that appealed on a basic level to a lot of voters. But a lot of time has passed since there, and it can't last forever. People have understood more about how the pandemic is working. They have different expectations. They've had different promises broken, and it's just waning, and it's getting worse. Well, here's another thing that I need explained to me as well. And right now, we have a situation where, again, in the Greg Lyle poll, the Innovative Research Group poll, the Ontario Liberals are now in first place. Now, you'd rather be in first place on Election Day as opposed to 14 months before Election Day, but if you're a party with eight seats and you're not even an officially constituted party in the legislature and your leader hasn't got a seat, being in first place is not a terrible thing. Rob, my question has more to do with the NDP. They are the official opposition. They are the ones who are only a couple of dozen seats away from being able to form the next government of Ontario. They're in third place in all of the last four polls I've seen. How come? That's a very good question, Stephen. I don't quite get it myself because uh, on paid sick leave, on uh, strengthening long-term care, uh, on a lot of other pandemic-related issues, the, the NDP has been front and center. And Andrea Horvath uh, you know, has been a fierce critic of the government. And for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to be translating in, these, in those polls. I've seen some other polling that showed the Tories still ahead and the NDP in second and the Liberals in third. So, I mean... Uh, but to your po earlier point, Steve, polls, uh, you know, 13, 14 months before an election really don't count for a whole lot. 
Um, uh, but if I were a new Democrat strategist, and I'm, uh, I would be concerned that we're not getting a bump. And why is Stephen Del Duca appearing to get a bump in those particular polls? I don't understand it myself. It's not that he is, uh, you know, it's not like Del Duca mania is sweeping the, the province, as I was joking with one of his, uh, his uh, advisors the other day. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, it, it, this situation is helping him. Now, it could be spillover with, the, you know, the liberal brand federally is very strong traditionally in Ontario. So that could be uh, a part of it. But if I'm Stephen Del Duca's team, I like this because I can, I, you know, they held a fundraiser the other night. Um, they can they can raise money off things like this, and it's good for them as they head to an election next year. Yeah, Jess, uh, Rob is quite right that polls today aren't going to tell you who's going to win the election in June of 2022, but they will sure make caucus members and party supporters yeah. either happy or skittish, depending on where they are in the polls right now. Do you have any insight into why the New Democrats aren't doing better since they seem to be on the side that most Ontarians are on, when it comes to the big issues of the day? Well, I have a theory. Hopefully that helps. When people are at a time of crisis, I don't think they want to try something new. I think people want stability. And while voters don't know leader Stephen Del Duca, they kind of have an idea of what a liberal government is. And some people might find that sort of middle of the road comforting. They might be thinking, this is not the time to reform and try an NDP government for the first time in a very long time. Let's go back to what we know, because we're really getting tired of how Doug Ford has led us to the pandemic. But that's just a guess. That's a pretty good theory. It's the best theory, best theory I've heard in the last 24 hours. So I'm going to take that one. Uh, Rob, let's talk about rumors. We do, we do hear room. We've heard rumors about a cabinet shuffle, a pending cabinet shuffle for a very long time. And, and this group that's in there right now have been in there for almost two straight years. And as we know, the past 14, 15 months have not been a normal 14, 15 months in political life. Question, how, how well served would the premier be right now to get some different voices in there and maybe take over from some of the people who you've got to believe are just exhausted right now? Uh, you know, I mean, I know it's it's fashionable to say that there's going to be a shuffle imminently, but I mean, everyone that I've talked to who would know uh, says that that's not happening. So I, I don't know. I, I will be very surprised if he shuffles the cabinet this, in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, that kind of thing. Having said that, he does need to bring uh, former finance minister Rod Phillips back into the into the cabinet. Of course, Phillips resigned on December 31st after taking that uh, ill-considered trip to St. Bart's over the winter break. Um, you know, as I, I, I told him, I said he's the first politician in history who ever re resigned for going on vacation with his wife on a trip that you paid for and did work while you were away. But anyway, uh, he, he, he did step down and because the government was taking a lot of heat, uh, understandably. Uh, but uh, it is clear that they need Rod Phillips at the table. That, that's obvious because Ford trusts him um, and they, they need some more heft at the cabinet table. They need some, there is definitely a need for some new blood. There's some people that in the cabinet room that probably shouldn't be there any longer. They may not be running next year. There's other reasons to, 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 uh, to there's some people that I would promote if I were him. There's, I look at uh, people like uh, Prab Sarkaria, uh, Jill Dunlop and uh, Kinga Surma, the three, three of the associate ministers who performed very well, uh, very strongly in, the, in their sort of junior roles. I could see them getting promoted in some shuffle. But again, I don't know. This is not really a time to blow up the team. Uh, but it is time to get, I would get Rod Phillips, if I were Doug Ford, out of the penalty box and back on the ice where you need him. Jess, what's your view on that? I agree 100% with Rob there. Uh, yes to shuffling the cabinet, but not until the crisis is over. Uh, while hospitals are still bursting to the seams, it just makes you look way yeah. more unstable. All right, let's finish up on this then, folks. I know the Toronto Star, Rob, is the best newspaper in the country. However... We try. <laughs> I'm going to quote the Washington Post here, because it's not often you hear about the Washington Post uh, being interested in the affairs of the province of Ontario. This column got a lot of attention because uh, there was a column calling on Doug Ford to resign. Now, to be clear, the Washington Post was not editorially calling... <laughs> no. for Doug Ford to resign. But there was an op-ed columnist who wrote a column, David Moskrop is his name, and here's what he had to say about the state of affairs in our province. Over a year into the pandemic, things are worse in Ontario than they have been since it began. Enough is enough. It's time for Ford to go. He must resign. Getting rid of a premier with a majority government is difficult outside of an election, but Ontarians cannot wait to hold Ford accountable at the ballot box. A caucus revolt might do it, 
But even without one, for the good of the province and his own party, Ford should catch the next train to political oblivion. So says David Mosscrop a week ago in the, or I guess a few days ago now, in the Washington Post. Okay, Jessica, uh, I mean, I assume this is a non-starter in the Premier's office, but you tell me, are they thinking about it? I would doubt that, highly. Rob? You'd probably... <laughs> yeah, I mean... And also, I would caution about calling it the Washington Post. This is a, a freelancer from Ottawa who is a frequent critic of Doug Ford who happened to have a piece in the Washington Post. It's not the same thing as a real Washington Post columnist or the Washington Post editorial board saying that the, the Premier of Ontario should resign. I mean, it's it's significant in the sense that it's, it's uh, you know, it, it got a lot of traction on social media. But no offense to David Moscow, I, I hadn't really heard of him before he did this piece. Uh, so, I mean, again, I don't pretend to be an expert on Ontario politics, but it didn't it didn't strike me as being a particularly uh, significant uh, development that a freelancer would write a piece for the Post. That being said, uh, are there other c pundits out there saying that Ford should go? Yeah, there are. And that's not a good thing for them, for Ford. But is he going anywhere? No, he's not going anywhere. Not not because of anything that anyone writes in a newspaper. No, but uh, Jess, let's just try this one on for size. Stephen Del Duca held a news conference, I think it was yesterday or the day before, in which he said, he used a World War II analogy. He said, look, Neville Chamberlain couldn't get the job done. The Tory caucus in the United Kingdom revolted. They kicked him out and they put Winston Churchill in. And he said, it is not, it, it, it is not unprecedented for a caucus to decide that the guy at the helm can't do the job and we need somebody else. Is there any evidence that any Conservatives are considering that at all? None that I've heard. And I will note that the Conservatives who have defected from the party during the pandemic have been on the very anti-lockdown side of things. Um, any murmurings that were are happening of discontent on the other side, like the province should have done paid sick days earlier, should be acting more cautiously, should have locked down earlier, they've been very quiet. We've heard nothing from them. Rob, do you imagine there's one Tory backbencher who might come forward and call for the Premier's resignation? No, but remember what happened to Patrick Brown in 2018. Uh, some caucuses can be, a caucus, can be caucuses of jackals, and they can turn on a leader, and we've seen it We've seen regicide committed at Queen's Park before, and we, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to see it now. Not just, I mean, it just doesn't seem likely, but if they start to wor worry about their seats, then who knows what happens. You two, uh, stay at it, stay safe, and we thank you both for coming on to TVO tonight. Jessica Smith-Cross from QP Briefing, Robert Benzie from the Toronto Star. Well done, everybody. Thank you. When you've got a century-old hockey franchise, how do you decide what was the most important, memorable goal of all time? Well, candidly, somewhat arbitrarily. But I'd nominate a goal scored 70 years ago today. It was April 21st, 1951, when Maple Leafs defenseman Bill Barilko scored in overtime to defeat the Montreal Canadiens and give the Leafs their fourth Stanley Cup in five years. Yes, kids, once upon a time, the Leafs were a dynasty. But that magic turned Tragic. Later that summer, when the 24-year-old Barilko flew off for a fishing trip and disappeared. It would be more than a decade later before the wreckage of his plane crash would be found in northern Ontario. Joining us tonight to remember the most iconic goal in Leafs history, we welcome, in Minnetonka, Minnesota, Frank Klisinich. He is Bill Barilko's nephew. In Dundas, Ontario, Suzanne Primo. Her grandfather, Gentleman Joe Primo, coached the Leafs to that Stanley Cup victory. She's also on the board of directors of the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame. In Ajax, Ontario, Kevin Shea, who 10 years ago wrote the definitive book on the defenseman's life called Barilko Without a Trace. And in Brampton, Ontario, Mark Farah, the world's number one Barilko collectibles aficionado which we see all over the background of that picture. And, Mark, we look forward to finding out more about that. Listen, I'm grateful to all of you for coming together on this 70th anniversary of the most iconic goal, I would suggest, in Maple Leafs history. And to get us into the mood, who better than Foster Hewitt to take us back? Sheldon, if you would. Here's right in front of Meeker. Meeker went by the net, stutters out in front. McNeil fell right in front again.
And thanks to Hockey Time Machines, Paul Patsko, for that uh, iconic yeah. and wonderful play-by-play -play of Foster Hewitt's from so many years ago. Frank, I've got to ask, when you hear that, what goes through your mind? Well, I get shivers hearing it. I, uh, I love seeing the clip. And uh, it just, it's, a, it's a huge sense of pride uh, to be able to participate on the anniversary of that 70th goal. Your mom was Bill Barilko's kid sister, and um, his nickname was Bashin Bill Barilko. Does that give us some sense about what kind of player he was? Uh, he was a tough cookie. Uh, he, he made sure that all his players, his teammates, were protected, uh, and he was not afraid to uh, muck it up. And we should point out as well that um, this goal was scored, of course, seven years ago today. You were born a couple of months later, so you never knew your uncle, did you? That's correct. I've only known him through Kevin's book and my mom's scrapbooks. Understood. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, who was behind the Leaf bench coaching that night? Oh, that would be someone I would know very well, would be my papa, gentleman Joe Primo. And you did know him, right? Yes, yes. He died in 1989, May of 1989. I think, if memory serves, that all the members of that winning Leaf team got a special souvenir for winning that game and winning the cup. Anything you want yes, to lay on did. us right now? Yes, actually. Um, everyone got this, which is a beautiful uh, silver box that um, has an embossed Stanley Cup. Can you see it all right? Yeah, we sure can. And it says Joe Primo, 1951 on the bottom, but all the other players, including Bill and uh, Ted Kennedy, everyone would have received this. And it's a, it's a wonderful collectible piece, and I, I absolutely adore it. Beautiful. Kevin, Barilko, of course, was an instant hero when he got that goal, but four months later, he decided he wanted to go on a fishing trip with his dentist. They flew off in a small plane to, I guess, northern Quebec, and they didn't make it back. You chronicled all of this in your book. Give us your best recap of what people think happened on that way home. Well, so, so the goal was a melancholy goal. You know, it was happiness, but we know that the sadness followed if, if we've chronicled the story. So August 24th, they fly up to Seal River in northern Quebec. They have a wonderful fishing trip, apparently, uh, looking for Arctic char, which was a, a real favorite. The irony, of course, is that Bill Barocco loved to fish, he sure didn't like the taste of fish. But anyway, on the way back, they stopped. They stopped at a, at a little place to refuel along the way. And, and they were warned at that point that the weather wasn't very good, that maybe they should stay overnight. There was uh, lodging that was available to them there. But uh, Dr. Hudson insisted, hey, we're going to be fine. We have to get back. We've got some, some commitments. And that was the last that they were seen until all those years later on. They, uh, they encountered terrible weather with perhaps a heavy load with perhaps some reckless flying and uh, they ended up in the the unforgiving forest north of Cochrane, Ontario not to be seen until that plane was found all those years later. Now Frank I gather he left on a Friday and your grandmother Bill's mother tried to get him not to leave what was that all about? Uh, Friday, that Friday was uh, considered bad luck in our family because that's uh, my grandfather, Steve Barocco, died on a Friday. And when mm. uh, Billy told my grandmother that he was going to go on this fishing trip before uh, uh, training camp opened, she said, no, please don't go. This is not the right day to go. And, and you got to go to training camp soon anyway, so don't go. And Billy said, nothing's going to happen, Mom. And uh, the next morning as he was leaving, he went in to say, to goodbye to his mother, and she was so angry with him, she didn't acknowledge it. Frank, when it became clear, as days turned into weeks, that Bill was not coming home, what did that do to your family? Well, I know it was traumatic. Uh, my grandmother never stopped hoping and wishing and, and praying that Billy would somehow miraculously uh, come out of the uh, wilderness, that he had amnesia, that he would show up. And she held on to that dream until we finally realized that the, plash, the, the plane crash site had been found in 62. Well, all right, Kevin, pick up the story there if you would. It would be 11 years later before the wreckage was found. How, in fact, was it found? Well, just in the most uh, ridiculous sort of way, it was it was a helicopter, June 6, 1962. A helicopter sees a glint of metal or a glint of yellow or something that was a little bit untoward in those forests. He returned back to his, his office and said, yes, yeah, saw something there. I don't know what it was. And, and what happened was the gentlemen were saying, well, I wonder if it might be the Barocco Hudson plane. 
So he did a little bit more research and went back on June 15th, 1962. And sure enough, they found the spot once again. It was not easy to get to. So what they did is they, they circled the spot and dropped toilet paper out so they could come back and find it a little bit later on. And, and so that was the way that they were able to find the crash site, which certainly was there. The pontoons were quite visible at that particular time. So it just happened to be synchronicity that the right time of year, the right day, the right pilot flying at the right time was able to see the crash site. Hmm. Now, Suzanne, I, I know gentleman Joe Primo was your grandfather, and therefore, you know, you would have had different conversations with him than I would have. I'd have talked hockey with him all the time. You'd have talked family, <laughs> perhaps. But I wonder if you did ever have conversations with him about that team, about Barilko, about the goal, about the disappearance, all of that kind of stuff. Well, I can tell you this. Uh, Steve, that my uncle Bob Primo, who uh, is uh, the son of Joe Primo and my dad's uh, brother, uh, told me uh, about how he was actually at the game and was sitting there with somebody pretty special that could have been on the ice at the same time but wasn't due to a con con conflict of interest and that being that uh, he just happened to be his uncle Jim Primo, my great uncle Jim Primo, who was the brother of my grandfather, Joe Primo. So as an NHL referee himself, he was not allowed to actually ref the game. Uh, and maybe luckily so, because we, we can't have uh, that goal being called back for a conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Now, how is it also, Suzanne, follow up with this. You, you got a pair of Bill Barilko skates at some point in your family's life. What's that story? Well, that's very true. So at that, during that season, now I know that... Uh, um, Papa would say that every player would get two to three pairs of skates a year. Now, whether these were the pair of skates in question, we don't know. But Papa came home one day in 1951 and gave those a pair of skates to my Uncle Bob, the same one sitting in the seats who watched that um, infamous goal. And he used them playing at University of Toronto while uh, studying for his engineering degree. And he said, I skated on those till the rivets fell out. So <laughs> yes, indeed, who would have thought, right? But uh, amazing to be uh, in, a, in such uh, infamous uh, shoes. And Suzanne, where are those skates today? You know what? I'm not certain where those skates are today. I'd have to quiz my Uncle Bob about that. But um, I don't know that uh, they made it too far after that because if the rivets fell out, then at that point, they they may not have been uh, as useful, even though they may be a collector. They are a collector's item today. Well, Uncle Bob's 89 and a half. So you make sure you get to him and get back to me on where those skates are because I want to know. Kevin? I will tell you that. Okay. Kevin, um, again, take us back to the day uh, Bill Barilko, was there, was there a woman in his life at the time? Well, in fact, there was, but there seems to be a little confusion. In doing the book, I interviewed a number of his teammates, and they said, well, Bill was quite a man about town. He was well-known, and he liked to squire beautiful young ladies as well. But there was one particular lady that I want to bring attention to. Her name was Louise Hastings. And Louise Hastings was, was definitely somebody that he was dating, uh, maybe... She thought maybe even engaged. He'd given her a ring at one point. Not a not an engagement ring, but a ring of promise. And so she had gone up to Timmins a couple of times and, and had met uh, Bill's, uh, Bill's mother, rather, and the family. Um, she was waiting for Bill to come home so they could spend a little bit of time at her cottage on Lake Simcoe before he went off to training camp and did his other responsibilities. So Louise Hastings always maintained a passion for Bill through her entire life. She passed about five years ago, but even when I was interviewing her before the uh, before her passing, she still had pictures of Bill Barocco on her nightstand in her bedroom. It was uh, it was a love story beyond compare. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark Farah, I want to thank you for your patience because now that the story is in place, we are going to have um, a fun time going through the cornucopia of collectibles that you have. Are you in your basement in Brampton right now? I am. I am right now. It looks like a museum in there. Why don't you give us just a sense about what kind of Barilco collectibles you've got? Well, I mean, to break it down, I think there's about there's over 150 pieces in total. Um, everything from over my one shoulder here that you'll see, that's the uh, most of the remains of the fuselage. Uh, you might recognize the two seats. Uh, that are facing the camera right now. The one, um, well, they both had uh, the bodies of Barocco and Hudson in them, that, which laid for 11 years. Um, below that, I've mm -hmm. got the picture of the original plane, uh, the actual plane 
on my other side of my shoulder, just beside my head here, you'll see that's the program and ticket stub from that game. That's the only known ticket stub in existence uh, from that game. And then above that is a picture of uh, Bill when he played with the Hollywood Wolves. It's, it's one of the only known team signed photos as well. Uh, on the other side of the pro, you'll see another program on the other side there. That's from Bill's very first home game when he scored his first NHL goal along with Sid Smith. Um, in the display case is the, the remarkable story and the remarkable puck, uh, which was owned by the Donahue family uh, in Hamilton, right from the moment that puck, uh, that goal was scored until uh, just about actually a year ago today. Hold on to that story about the puck. I want to come back to that. But you dropped something in the middle of that answer that I would just want to follow up briefly with Frank on. Okay, here's Bill Barilko. He's a kid from Timmins, Ontario. He's never been in an airplane in his life. And suddenly he goes to the Pacific Coast Hockey League and he's playing hockey in Hollywood. How the heck did that happen? Well, Billy and his brother Alec, his older brother Alec, uh, had been uh, playing hockey all their lives. And a scout uh, saw them play and said, I think these young uh, Brilco boys are going to be able to do fine. And we're going to we're going to get them into the Pacific Coast League. So Billy and Alec head out to California. Can you imagine a, an 18 year old teenager hopping on a plane for the first time and going all the way to Los Angeles? Uh, so they go out and start playing uh, Alex with uh, one team and Billy's with the Hollywood Wolves. And uh, they they're having a great time. And somehow, I guess, he got traded to a, another minor league team in Pittsburgh. The Leafs have an injury. He gets called up from Pittsburgh to the Leafs, and suddenly he's in the big show. Yes? The, uh, the call was, we need a defenseman in Pittsburgh. We're the American Hockey League affiliate. And uh, he gets to Pittsburgh, and it's called, uh, no, just keep going northbound. The Leafs need a defenseman. So he eventually gets into Toronto, and, uh, wow. and, he, never, and he never left. He was there for four and a half years. Isn't that something? Okay, Mark, come on back in here. Bill's 1951 Stanley Cup winning ring. Do you have that? It's believed that that's the, the ring that uh, that's part of the collection. And uh, it was never sized, obviously, to Bill. Uh, it was given to them mm. after the, the goal was scored. Um, and so, yeah, so it's it's believed to be the the uh, ring that he was given after, obviously, after he could succumb to the plane crash. Right. Okay, Mark, mm -hmm. now we got to follow up on that item over, as we're looking at it at the right of the screen, but over your left shoulder. That's the puck that Barilko put behind Jerry McNeil, the goaltender of the Montreal Canadiens, game five, overtime. Every, every game in that series, incidentally, went into overtime. Amazing. Never happened before, never mm -hmm. happened since. But there's controversy. Because the Hockey Hall of Fame thinks they have the puck. You think you've got the puck. What's the story? Well, I think that that story has changed, actually. Um, with Kevin uh, working with the Hall of Fame, we've had some discussions about this. And it's believed that the Hall of Fame is now officially recognizing this as the puck. And that's because um, the puck that was uh, given to the Hockey Hall of Fame, and keep in mind, back then, things were given on handshakes. We didn't have the, the ability to look into things like we do today. So, you know, the, the Hockey Hall of Fame is given the puck. Uh, they keep it. It's claimed to have been given to them from a boy in a wheelchair who was given the puck from the referee. When, in fact, um, that puck that was given to them, the NHL stopped using in 1942, nine years before this goal was scored. So, you know, mysteriously, uh, you know, a family comes out in, in 2015 and says, hey, guys, we have the puck. We're not a big hockey family. Um, we're not, you know, they've, they've definitely got some money. They don't need the money. So there's no reason for them to make this up. And uh, it turns out that their family, the Donahue family, um, which owned a, a very famous uh, pub in, in Hamilton, uh, the Wellington Pub, um, and they they turned around and and uh, their their great well their grandfather had four tickets to the game, uh, took them to the game, took their father, their uncle, and him and a driver to the game, and uh, when the goal was scored, uh, Harry, their son, which is the Donahue boys' father, uh, had asked his dad Jeremiah to run down on the ice uh, to to possibly get the puck. And um, as he went down to the ice, his father said, sure, yeah, absolutely. See if they'll let you on the ice. Uh, he hopped on the boards, went over, grabbed the puck, and, and uh, the rest is history. All right, Kevin, I want you to pick up the story because I gather we know that the puck that is in Mark's basement is the puck because of mm. the logo on it. Can you compare the logo on that puck to the mm. one in the Hall of Fame right now? Well, Mark is exactly right. The, the, the provenance of the puck... At, at the time when it was given to the Hockey Hall of Fame, it was, as, as Mark said, it was on a handshake. It was handed to the curator with the story behind it. Sounded credible. We don't do the same kind of provenance 
they didn't do the same kind of providence then that we certainly do now. Uh, that puck was was predating the one that Bill Barocca would have used to score the Stanley Cup winning goal. So this one mm. has the story. But what has happened that's really curious is that Paul Patskow, who's just the most extraordinary historian, especially when it comes to video, was able to to denounce the story that the Hall of Fame had because he, he mm -hmm. saw the footage and the referee was skating away and the puck was still in the net. And there is an image. You can't say a face, but there's an image reaching over, skidding across the ice, reaching over to get the puck. And so it seems probable, almost 100 percent so, that the Donahue family has the Barocco puck and that the one in the Hall of Fame that was purported to be the, uh, the Stanley Cup winning goal is unlikely to be so. Because I gather the one in the Hall of Fame has a logo on it that they stopped using uh, in the 1940s. Mm. And this goal, of course, right. was scored in 51. Yes, exactly. But, but with uh, with the Internet, with the, the kind of research that's been done, all of a sudden, these things that weren't known before are certainly becoming well known to those who are involved in research. And that's one of the ways that we found out as well. OK, I want to uh, now ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up a picture of one of the most iconic sites. There's that word again. We're going to use that a lot tonight. This is one of the most iconic sites mm -hmm. In Timmins, Ontario, this is Bill Barilko's final resting place. Frank, he finally got the funeral he deserved in 1962 when his remains were found. And you were there that day at the funeral, were you not? Yes, I was. Uh, at that time, uh, we'd moved from Timmins to London, Ontario. And, uh, and you know, we got, a th we got the call. Uh, the crash site's been, we think the crash site's been found. Then it was confirmed. Uh, then the then there were plans, and we up, up to Timmins. We went for a funeral, and uh, it was a, a, a surrealistic situation to be burying somebody who had died uh, eleven years earlier. Who was at the funeral? Well, I remember uh, some of the pictures uh, show all the family members, of course, and uh, uh, a large congregation from Timmins and Schumacher. I know Alan Stanley was one of the pallbearers, uh, and that's that's the one individual I can recall. Alan Stanley, of course, a great defenseman for the Leafs for many, many years. Stanley Cup champion as well. And another Timmins boy. And another Timmins guy. Yes, indeed. Well, one of the reasons, there's, there's um, I mean, there are reasons and then reasons and more reasons why I would suggest this is the most iconic goal scored in Maple Leaf history. Never mind that it won a Stanley Cup. Never mind the mm -hmm. association with Billy's disappearance uh, shortly after scoring the goal. But then a little over 25 years ago, there was a little group out of Kingston, Ontario, that wrote a song that um, that brought the story to a whole new generation. 50 Mission Cap, tragically hip, Mr. Director, if you would. Love that song. Kevin, how influential do you think that song has been in keeping Bill Barocco's legacy alive? Extraordinary. Um, just massive, because it took it into the pub popular... Uh, it, it brought it into to popular culture after being long forgotten for so long. I don't know how well Bill Barocco would have been remembered had that song not come out. Brought it to a new generation, a third generation perhaps as well. It's ubiquitous across radio airwaves now. Whether you were a Toronto Maple Leaf fan or you know who Barocco was, you know those lyrics. And, and so it, it just opened up the floodgates again to recognizing the story and who Bill Barocco was and what he meant to this city. Suzanne, what do you think? Oh, yes, definitely. I really feel that uh, uh, I recall Uncle Bob saying that I believe that Todd Sloan had just sort of t had tied it up just minutes or so before the overtime and uh, it went into overtime and then Burrell Co scored. And that's pretty exciting for when you're right there at that moment uh, in the scene 
but it always helps that when we want to keep continuing history, that that we bring it back, as Kevin says, into pop culture or into today's um, today's living life. And I definitely agree with uh, with what Kevin has to say about that beautiful song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Todd Sloan just, uh, I think, with about 32 seconds left in the third period of that game, tied the score for the Leafs, sending the game yeah. to overtime. And then Billy scored uh, less than three minutes into yeah. the overtime, I think. Uh, Frank, uh, I, I wonder if you would share the story of, <laughs> of how your mother found out the Tragically Hip were playing a concert in Mississauga where she lived at the time. She goes to the arena, and what happens? Well, Mum tells me that uh, she's heard about this group. Did I know anything about them? And I said, Mum, I've never heard of Tragically Hip. We're living in Mississauga at the time, and with three kids, we've got a busy household. I'm not keeping <laughs> in touch with, uh, with music. So mom says, well, I'm going to go over to the Hershey Center and, and introduce myself. So she knocks on, the, uh, on one of the doors and a guard says, uh, what do you want? She says, well, I'm, uh, I'm Bill Barocco's sister and I'd like to meet the Tragically Hip. And he says, well, a lot of people would like to do that, but Barocco's sister, let me go and see if they can see you. Well, goodness knows, the door opens up again. Mom gets uh, escorted down the, the corridor and the tragically hip are ecstatic to meet her and she's ecstatic to meet them. And, uh, and they spent a bit of time talking about Billy and they said, well, why, we would like you to come back to the concert. And she said, no, I've got to get home and make dinner for my husband. <laughs> now, Mark, I, th I think it was, and you, somebody will correct me if I've got this wrong, but I think at the 50th anniversary, of the Barilco goal. In other words, 20 years ago, they had a fantastic ceremony at Centre Ice at the Air Canada Centre. The Tragically Hip was out there. Frank's mother, Anne, Barilco's sister, was out there as well. And Gord Downey presented to Anne a framed picture of his handwritten lyrics of 50 Mission Cap. My question for you, Mark, is where is that framed picture today? It's uh, located just to the side of me here as a part of the exhibit. Um, very honored to have that as a piece, and, and uh, it, it grabs a lot of attention. A lot of people are gravitated to the fact that the, uh, and, and myself included, uh, I didn't know who, you know, the tragic we have had written this song until, I, but I knew the words, and then once I realized it was it was Barocco, uh, my friends and everybody just to gravitated to the story as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark, I know I'm about to use a football analogy, which one should never do when talking hockey, but I'd like to pull an audible <laughs> here. Is it close enough for you to be able to grab right this moment and show us what it looks like? Because it's Gord Downey's handwritten. Yeah, go ahead. Go take a go. Grab it and show it to us. Gord Downey hand wrote these lyrics, and I would love for people to be able to see what it was. And th and these this is the framed uh, item that was presented by Gord Downey to Ann Klisinich cool. 20 years ago on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Barilco goal. Okay, Sheldon, let's see the shot. Here it is right now. There it is. My goodness, what a collector's item that is. Invaluable, Mark, invaluable. And all the members of the hip have signed it, and there's the handwritten lyrics. Outstanding. Thank you for that. Um, okay, in our remaining moments here, Frank, uh, you were two months old when your uncle disappeared, and I wonder how often you think to yourself, my God, I sure wish I would have had a chance to meet this guy. Yeah. Uh, I think about that about every year on the anniversary of the goal. Uh, if there's one person I wish I could have met in my lifetime, and, 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 and as I was growing up, it was Billy Barocco, my uncle, uh, to see him continue his career in, uh, as a Toronto Maple Leaf, and then what happened afterwards. But uh, I was never given that opportunity. Hmm. Kevin, because of your book and the years of research that went into that, I mean, you may know Bill Barilko better than anybody else alive today, even though you obviously never met him either. How often do you think to yourself, man, I wish I'd had a chance to meet that guy? Uh, on a regular basis, Steve, I, I really do. I felt like I knew him, and I felt like he was someone that would be just a, a dear friend as well. You have to remember that we lost him at the age of 24, so he really was yeah. a man boy. And all of the, uh, the, the players he was uh, colleagues with said that he was the life of the party. He was kind of like, and I'll use a, 
a reference, you know, like Weird Al Yankovic, I guess probably more like Spike Jones, insofar as he was in the dressing room and always so cheerful and changing the lyrics to songs and just making everybody have a lot of fun. He just, he loved life. He was just a, a, a terrific young man, quality young man, raised properly and, and a real loss to all of us. Mark Farrell, <laughs> let me give you the last word on this. You have got so many spectacular items there. What's the plan for your basement? Well, um, uh, unfortunately, I was a victim of the Maple Leaf Garden sex scandal as a young boy. And so I would like to find a way to use this exhibit to help raise some money for awareness so that other people can see, learn the story, and stay on top of it. Um, hopefully, maybe to raise some money for the Canadian Cancer Society as well, because my dad's a cancer survivor. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I can't thank all of you enough for gathering together virtually and joining us on this 70th anniversary of this momentous occasion, I would remind people, Kevin Shea's book is called Barilko Without a Trace. It's the best thing ever written on this. And if you're a Montreal <laughs> Canadiens fan and you want the other side of the story, uh, in the pressure of the moment, remembering Jerry McNeil, because he was the guy in the mm. picture, as they say. He was the guy who gave up the winning goal and had to live with that for the rest of his life. It was written by his son, David McNeil, and that's a good read as well. Frank Klicinich, Suzanne Primo, Kevin Shea, Mark Farah, Happy anniversary, everybody. 70 years on from the most iconic goal in Maple Leafs history. Go Thank Leafs you so go. much. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Tomorrow is Earth Day, so we'll check in on new efforts to reduce the amount of plastic in our environment. Now, just a note before we go, today is our last day in this studio, probably for a while. Given the state of the pandemic, to keep everyone here as safe as possible, we're going back to a completely remote studio setup. That allows us to stay on the air, even with our real studio dark. Hopefully, we'll be back here before long. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you tomorrow, once again, from my attic. Until then. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org daily. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.